WNYC Studios is supported by GEICO. How would you love a chance to save some money on car insurance? GEICO can help. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote and get started seeing how much you could save. Listener supported. WNYC Studios. It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Good morning again, everyone. Now, our climate story of the week. You think it's been hot here? The heat wave in southern China is that country's worst on record. But get this. It may also be the worst heat wave anywhere in the world in modern history. Cities in Sichuan province, home to 80 million people, this is southwest China, kind of near India and what we call Southeast Asia, Vietnam and Thailand, etc., One article I saw called it a 70-day heat wave, and there have been other superlatives for how unusual and possibly unique this summer has been there. One city in the region, Gao, hit 110 degrees Fahrenheit last week. The heat has been devastating in general, and it's been accompanied by drought and power shortages. The power shortages have really had a lot of impact on people's lives, and as a result, factories have had to shut down. Livestock have died on farms and cities have been dimmed and it may amount to yet another wrinkle in the global supply chain as well. We will talk more about this unprecedented heat wave and its implications and relationship to climate change now with Bob Henson, meteorologist, journalist, and regular contributor to Yale Climate Connections. And also with us is Eunice Yoon, Beijing bureau chief and senior correspondent at CNBC and NBC News. Bob, welcome to WNYC. Eunice, welcome back. Great to have you both with us. Thanks, Thank Brian. you so much. And Eunice Yoon, put this heat wave in context. How hot has it been and where is it hottest? It is uh, very hot along the uh, longest river in China, which is the Yangtze. And you had mentioned temperatures hitting 110 degrees. In some places, they've actually hit 113 degrees. And uh, the uh, day count at this point is 78 days of the heat wave. This is the most severe uh, since some of the uh, weather authorities have been keeping records. In 1961, uh, the uh, weather authorities have been reporting red alerts for cities since June 13th. And uh, by red alert, that means that red is the highest in a three-tier system and means that your temperatures are hitting over 40 degrees Celsius for about 104 degrees Fahrenheit in a 48-hour period and look as though it's going to continue that way. So this is also um, very wide, has a very wide scope because it's estimated about 900 million people have been suffering under the heat warnings. Wow. Um, and yeah, so it's just it's just affecting, uh, as you had mentioned, so many different aspects of life here in China. And Bob Henson, anything you would like to add about how unprecedented this extreme heat is? Eunice just mentioned the date June 13th as when these red alerts started being issued. I guess that would back up the article I read that said a 70-day heat wave. Um, That's right. In China, the uh, standard definition for heat wave is at least three days where the high temperature is 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 Celsius. So uh, by that measure, um, there has been a heat wave in at least some part of China since mid-June. So I think the, the, the poster child, if you will, for the how bad this has been would be the city of Chongqing, which is about 10 million in the main part of the urban area. Uh, Technically, it's the largest city on earth in terms of metro, but uh, that's over an area the size of Austria. So the core urban part of the city is is on the order of 10 million. Um, They have had, just (laughs) imagine this, the low temperature has been at least 86 degrees for three solid weeks. Wow, the The low temperature. uh, yeah, that even outdoes Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix has never been that warm uh, day and night for that long a period. Uh, most of those days, the high temperature was above 107. And mind you, they have a, a hot, humid climate in the entire Yangtze Valley. Uh, there are cities known as the Four Furnaces for its a legendarily hot, humid climate. But even by those standards, um, temperatures have been you know 10 degrees above normal every night and 15 Fahrenheit above normal every day. Listeners, this is our climate story of the week, and we have time now for a few calls, or we have time in this conversation for a few calls about China's extreme heat and drought. 
and their broader implications in China and beyond. Anybody there right now or anybody been there since the middle of June and wants to report on this from personal experience or just anyone with a question about it, for our guests, Eunice Yoon from NBC News over there and meteorologist Bob Henson, 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692 or tweet at Brian Lehrer. And Bob, I imagine it isn't straightforward to determine, but how much of China's heat and drought can be directly attributed to climate change? Well, this is one of those classic situations where it'll take a what we call attribution study to determine exactly how much. However, I, I can tell you that this heat wave almost certainly would not have happened without climate change. Uh, there was a, an exhaustive study done on the 2013 heat wave, uh, which was the worst uh, up to this point. And the researchers found that that heat wave would have been virtually impossible without uh, the hand of climate change. So I, I just don't think this would have happened. Um, you know, to back up the statement you you read a little a while ago, this may be the worst heat wave in global history. When you average out how many people were affected, as Eunice said, close to a, a, a billion people, and the duration and the intensity. I mean, uh, Chongqing has had uh, as many you know tropical nights this year as they did for a whole 65 year period up to 2015. So you basically packed 60 years of heat into one summer, and um, we're not just talking a, a few record highs, but you know, week upon week of record highs. So um, it, it's truly mind boggling as someone who's followed high temperatures all over the globe. And my, my friend Maximiliano Herrera, who is probably the world's preeminent lay expert on extreme temperatures, agrees that this is probably uh, the worst heat wave by all those measures if you pull them together. Worst heat wave, wave in human history happening right now in China by those measures. Are there other meteorological or more weather as opposed to climate-related conditions that have also been contributing to it? I know in this country, when we get certain kinds of extreme weather patterns, people say, ah, but there's the El Nino, which is going on in the ocean, and things like that. Anything like that contributing that you're aware of? Well, as a matter of fact, we have a quite a strong La Nina pattern going on. We've had La Nina in place since 2020, so this is quite a prolonged event. Uh, been, it's been recurring and subsiding and recurring. So that may be involved. Um, there's not a ironclad relationship, though, between El Nino and La Nina uh, and uh, dr drought and heat in China. What really stands out to me is the drought heat connection there, because uh, it, there's also been quite an intense drought. And we know um, that when it's hot, uh, a drought impact is worse because the, the heat dries out the landscape uh, even more thoroughly. And this is something that is really kicking in with climate change. Uh, for example, in the Western US, uh, California used to have hot droughts and cool droughts, uh, but in the last uh, several decades, just about every drought now is a hot one. Huh. Uh, the, the heat actually allows the landscape to get even hotter, or the drought does rather, because a dry landscape allows more of that incoming sunshine to go into heating the air rather than uh, evaporating moisture. Eunice, you mentioned the Yangtze River before as being in Sichuan province, the center of the heat rave. And I've read that rivers are so low in some places that ships can't pass through them. Is that the case with the Yangtze at all? And if so, how is this inability of ships to get through uh, affecting the economy or otherwise people's lives? Well, it's absolutely happening. Uh, the state TV reported that there were 66 riverbeds around Chongqing that had been completely dried up. And it's very difficult to transport cargo um, in the Yangtze River right now, which is, of course, a, a really important waterway for China. In fact, some companies around there, um, many factories that have been using the Yangtze River have had to hire hundreds of truckers to try to get their cargo to the, the right places. And um, this is all coming as COVID restrictions are very, very tight. And uh, there's been a, a trucker shortage for a lot of companies because truckers don't really want to continue to deal with these restrictions, uh, especially cross border. So it's all very difficult um, for the economy right now. Um, I thought it was interesting when Bob had mentioned uh, Chongqing as being um, you know, one of the places that is most affected, which it definitely is. But what's interesting here is that a lot of people feel that Chongqing or, and another huge city, Chengdu, 
um, that they're a little bit better off because some of the smaller cities are struggling not only with power outages, but also with limited water supply. And um, what we're seeing in the Yangtze and all these like small cities or big cities that people are dealing with rolling brownouts where the authorities are rotating power restrictions for different districts or cutting power for certain hours every day. People have been complaining that they've been told their power cuts will be two hours and then it stretches for as long as eight hours. Mm. In some cities, office buildings are required to set the air conditioning at a maximum of 26 degrees Celsius. So that's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And when the government says you have to set your air conditioning at a certain level, you do it. <laughs> and um, they, there have also mm. been restrictions on elevators. So you can use it to go up in some places or to certain floors. And then there have been other cities where everyone just has to take the stairs. Um, people have also been asked to work from home because of the high temperatures. So it's just, it's, it's really unprecedented where people are sleeping under bridges and tunnels. Uh, they're going to air raid shelters just to avoid the heat. Um, we've been um, talking to people who've said that they've their tap water is, is constantly warm and, um, you know, mm. it's hard to go anywhere because, I mean, you mentioned the economy, shops, malls shut, have limited lighting. Um, and then it's not only in, in the Yangtze, in that southwestern area, it's also all along the river, including in Shanghai, which is on the way, way eastern end. And so even in Shanghai, if any of your listeners or if you've ever been to Shanghai, you know, this iconic uh, shot um, along the water with like glittering buildings and lots of decorative lights. Well, for a couple of days, those decorative lights were allowed. And there was a lot of power restrictions there just because um, Shanghai, like many other cities, actually sources their electricity or at least part of their electricity from Sichuan, the southwestern part. That is just so extreme. All of that sounds so extreme. Has there been a death toll from the heat wave? I actually haven't seen any major death toll, um, especially because um, a lot of the state media has been focused more on the um, kind of the heroic stories of the firefighters. And uh, we've been seeing a lot of wildfires over there. And there's been talk about how... Um, you know, 1,500 people had to be evacuated. Uh, thousands of firefighters are are on their way there. But I actually haven't heard so much of um, death from specifically from from the heat wave in any meaningful numbers. And with Eunice Yoon, Beijing bureau chief for CNBC and NBC News, and meteorologist Bob Henson, who's a regular contributor to Yale Climate Connections as we talk about perhaps the worst heat wave anywhere in human history in China right now. Thomas in Brooklyn, you're on WNYC. Hi, Thomas. Yeah, hi. Um, boy, my heart really goes out to the people that are suffering there. And I, I really don't want to make this sound like I'm blaming the victim, but my understanding is that China is responsible for about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, we certainly have not got our act together in the United States, but is there any possibility that this might, uh, you know, really help in, to to prod the Chinese government to do more to control greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, uh, just, you know, again, as I said, we, we haven't mm -hmm. got our act together here in the U.S., that's for sure, but just wondering about that. Thank you. Bob Henson, do you have any perspective on that? Uh, sure. Yes. The um, relationship between China and the United States in uh, greenhouse emissions over the last several decades is fascinating. Basically, if you put the U.S. and China together, that's been between 40 and 50 percent of global emissions for, for quite a while now. And what's happened is that the bulk of the manufacturing that's gone from the United States to China um, has been a large part of, of the driver of this. In other words, China is making more and more products for the U.S. So the greenhouse emissions associated with those products are now you know, registers being from China, which they are. But uh, if it's to serve the U.S., really, I, I think you have to look at, at China and the U.S. together in terms of global emissions. Now, part of the issue here is also that China is a massively large country. If you look per capita at emissions, uh, the U.S. is still well ahead of China for emissions per person. Uh, nevertheless, China is the largest emitter as a as a unit, as a nation. So uh, I know the, that China has a lot going on in terms of um, solar and wind energy. Um, they're doing a lot on renewables, but it's simply the scale of the problem there is so large. Uh, I, I know they are aiming to um, peak their emissions by 2030 
and bring them down to net zero, I believe by 2060. Um, that's not quite the same pace as a lot of other countries in the world. And for quite a while, um, many countries, including China, have said, well, we haven't had a chance to develop in the same way as uh, the historically uh, largest emitters, which the U.S. Is, is top of the heap on. So uh, there's a lot of factors in there. Um, I'm not sure that this by itself is going to be a huge motivator, in part because there's so many cross currents in global energy right now uh, with, between the pandemic and the Ukraine invasion in response to that. Uh, I, I think a lot of countries are kind of struggling just to keep their power systems going. So uh, it's going to be a, a rough ride, I think, for a year or two uh, to see how emissions fall out from all this um, activity. Looks like we're getting a call from China. Nick in Tianjin, China. Do I have that right, Nick? You're on WNYC. Hello from New York. Yeah, how you doing? Um, nice to speak with you, Brian. I'm a New Yorker, and it's, it's nice to um, have an opportunity to connect from China. That is so cool. Or is it so hot? You yeah. tell me. You know, you know, it's surprising. It's not so hot right now. Um, actually, we're having a cold spell at the moment. It's in the 50s. Or Where, where are you, know, you? Where in China is that? I'm, I'm in the north. Of, I'm in the north. I'm outside of Beijing. I'm in the city called Tian, which is um, kind of almost a somewhat suburb. It's like Philly, Philly in comparison to, uh, to New York. Mm-hmm. And what else would you like to add on this? Well, um, you know, it was pretty intense this summer. It was, uh, it was, it was really hot. I mean, you know, Celsius here, so we're in the, it was in the uh, above 40s. I was in the south, and at some times it was blisteringly hot. Not a lot of rain, um, but, I mean, to be honest, COVID is much more severe than any heat wave um, at the moment. Do so, you mean the COVID uh, restrictions? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's still very real here. Um, slowly, China is trying to kind of come around to um, at least seemingly relaxing its restrictions, but in fact, it's not really nothing is changing. So um, actually, no one talks about the heat wave here. It's irrelevant. Um, I mean, it's not really getting a lot of news other than the fact that occasionally you'll, you'll hear about um, droughts and, and certain cities are struggling for um you know, water, but, but in general, it's where COVID is much more real and the restrictions and the pandemic is, 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 is front and center. Really interesting, Nick. Thank you so much for checking in from there. I really appreciate it. Well, Eunice Yoon, for you in Beijing, as NBC News Beijing bureau chief, uh, what are you thinking as you're listening to Nick's call from the North? Well, um, he's absolutely right. COVID is very much front and center. And in fact, Tianjin which is very close to, to Beijing, um, is right in the middle of mass testing right now. Um, they had an, an outbreak, it's a mini outbreak, but but they're having to deal with, with more mass testing, which is something that we commonly see uh, throughout the country. Um, he mentioned that it's kind of gotten colder here. It's also colder in Beijing, it's in the 70s. Um, but this is after a lot of heat, and it's mainly um, in the Southwest that, that we're, we're watching now, that there are a lot of people who are feeling somewhat relieved that the temperatures are coming down, but their concern is still about the drought and the impact that the drought could have um, because it's probably going to continue until September or longer, uh, depending on what happens next with the harvest. And that's a huge concern because the autumn harvest is so important to China. It's 75% of the, the grain production, the annual grain production. So there are a lot of questions about that. And then, um, the um, other concern is that um, the Southwest is now on high alert for flash flooding uh, because uh, they are forecast to have rain uh, for the next several days. And they have had some a couple of days of rain and they're supposed to have another 10 days or so. But because the soil is so cracked and um, it's just so hardened that it doesn't absorb the water fast enough and, and people are worried about landslides next. And this is a, a part of the country that has been through so much. I mean, they've been through the heat wave and the power cuts and the COVID restrictions in the middle of all this, they have the wildfires and people were talking about how they would have to deal with a wildfire. And then they had a COVID outbreak that they're still dealing with right now. And so then at 4.30 in the morning, they have to go and get a COVID test. And it's, you know, it's like a hundred something degrees over there. So they've just been through so much um, right now. And um, now they're going to have to deal with the potential for 
for landslides and flash floods. And something like this is going on in, in Pakistan too, right? I wonder if either of you are keeping your eyes on that. Um, either Eunice, you as Beijing bureau chief uh, for NBC News or for you as, as a meteorologist, Bob, um, concerned with global climate issues, intense heat, like 50 degrees uh, Celsius, and now, I think, intense flooding. That, yes, that's right. Um, the uh, pre-monsoon heat was extreme in Pakistan, as it tends to be. Um, it was on the extreme end of what they tend to get in uh, season, you know, the um, late spring, and then the monsoon kicks in. Now, this is an example of where the Indian monsoon, South Asian monsoon, is a standard feature of climate, right? But every every so often, it will veer toward the west and affect Pakistan more dramatically than usual. So the landscape in Pakistan is so flood prone that whenever this happens, there is risk of flooding. Now, the floods in 2010 in Pakistan were the worst on record by far. And what's going on now is comparable to that. And some measures, not quite as bad as some, some measures worse. Uh, of course, it's still playing out as well. So we'll have to see how it, how it ends. But more than a thousand people killed and extremely dramatic, heartrending images of buildings collapsing and people being rescued. Uh, it is a tragedy, a massive tragedy. And uh, it's not a stretch to connect these in, in meteorologically in that when you have a intense high pressure cell uh, stagnant, uh, causing drought and heat in one location, it can sometimes shunt the rain making patterns to another location. And so I have no doubt that uh, when we put all the pieces together, the heat wave in China and the, the upper atmospheric conditions that cause that will also be related to what's uh, forcing the um, heavy rains in Pakistan. I, I should also add that uh, the last severe flooding in Pakistan in 2010 was during the last intense La Nina event. So in that location, there is a pretty strong connection to La Nina. Right. Interesting. And I said 50 degrees Celsius. That's 122 Fahrenheit. Uh, for those who don't know the conversion table on that. And really, Eunice, we've done segments now on our climate story of the week um, about China today, brought up Pakistan today. We did a separate on India a few weeks ago. And so it seems like in such large swaths of Asia, there's been nothing like has ever been seen before. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I, I was hoping to be able to add a little bit more to something that Bob had talked about when you Please. were talking about China's commitment for green energy, because uh, I totally agree with him. I think that China has reasons to want to pursue climate initiatives. Um, the authorities, even for this heat wave, uh, blamed it in part on climate change. Uh, so they do see that China is impacted by it. But there are other reasons why uh, I think Beijing is going to continue to to pursue it. And that's one, they want to dominate the technologies uh, like EVs. Uh, they would want to, uh, they've been really working hard to try to wean Beijing uh, or the, just the, the entire industry for cars um, off of Western technology, like the combustible engine. Um, also, the priority for the leadership is to try to get the country not to be so reliant on international sources of energy, uh, which they see as, as vulnerable uh, such as oil and gas. So that's been one big part of the pivot to of Vladimir Putin to get Russian oil and energy supplies that would be out of reach of uh, Western powers so that they wouldn't have to worry about it so much. We've also um, seen China move to be much more active in the Middle East. And there were uh, rumors going around that President Xi might actually be going to Saudi Arabia, um, which would have been very surprising because it would have been the first trip for him out of the country um, and it would be so soon um, ahead of a very important leadership um, um, resh reshuffle. And um, it hasn't happened, but, but it, it, the whole point is that he would want to be with a, a like-minded leader to help mm -hmm. China with oil. And um, I mean, the only thing right now that we're seeing is that the climate discussions are off between the U.S. and China because China said that that um, they didn't want to talk to the United States um, about it because uh, in response to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's recent visit to Taiwan, which Beijing mm. sees as part of China, and then also that her trip was an affront. But but uh, longer term for its own uh, its own uh, goals and longer term um, initiatives, it, I would think that China wouldn't fundamentally change its position on trying to be a, a climate change leader a climate change leader, and also with respect to the technology 
that you mentioned, trying to be a leader in EV electric vehicle technology and things like that. Um, and since you report from Beijing for the business channel of NBC, CNBC, when I was in China, the one time I was in China was 10 years ago, it was 2012, on a tour for journalists. And it wasn't an official tour by the government. It was by an independent group who was showing us good things, bad things. Uh, but certainly one of the things that they showed that was kind of promotional was a factory that was making um, solar panels. And mm -hmm. funny enough, I was there on a rainy day and one of um, my favorite photos that I think I've ever taken was of this mass solar panel farm, you might call it, that we were walking through and somebody walking through it with me with an umbrella. <laughs> so sol <laughs> solar panels in the rain. But obviously the point was they're trying to be a leader in solar panel technology and export it globally. How much has that turned out to be the case 10 years later? Uh, with it, in terms of solar panels, they've definitely been able to export solar panels and do quite well. And uh, the government continues to subsidize certain industries, which it believes it wants to be a leader on. And so, for example, with EV companies, they've they've done very well. Um, the government at one point uh, had decided that it wanted to pull some of the subsidies because it was just spending so much money, but that was just extended uh, recently, mainly here in China, because the government wants people to continue to buy EVs. I mean, EVs, are the, it's China is one of the biggest markets with EVs. And because they're so determined to become one of the, the leaders in the technology, um, just because they don't want to be as beholden to um, certain Western technologies, they want to leapfrog that technology that um, even you know, some slight um, problem, such as, for example, the infrastructure in Chongqing and in other um, southwestern uh, cities with EVs have had some problems, like the charging stations haven't been able to source as much power as they like or had to mm. be suspended, including Teslas. Um, but uh, I don't think that that's going to in any way uh, meaningfully change the overarching goal that the government has because they see it as bigger than just selling you know, having a couple of companies that sell EVs, uh, they, they, they want it to become a way that they could leapfrog uh, Western technology. Any reaction there then to uh, what we almost chose as our climate story of the week for this week? Maybe we'll do it next week. Uh, the decision by California to ban the sale of gasoline powered cars, new gasoline powered cars by 2035. Any reaction in China to that? That obviously should be a boon for the EV market. I didn't see uh, um, any specific reaction to that to that story here. Um, my guess is that a lot of Chinese companies would want to be able to capitalize on any regulatory changes that could help the companies. But you know, right now the, the U.S. and China relationship is so it's just so um, tense right now that it's hard to see um, where Chinese companies would be able to take it uh, take up opportunities um, by U.S. regulatory changes. No, I, I could throw in, uh, I, go I could ahead, throw go ahead, Bob. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, excuse me, just to throw in another tidbit on that. I think another challenge in terms of China responding to the uh, California mandate is that the new tax benefits for EVs introduced as part of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, specify that the some or all of the materials for each vehicle have to be sourced at or or manufactured in North America. So uh, that may complicate that that matter. Let me get one more phone call in here. Elise in Kingston, you're on WNYC. And since we're taking calls from all over the world, it seems, I should specify Kingston, New York, not Kingston, Jamaica. Hi, Elise. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Long-time listener. Love the show. Um, thank you for taking my call. I just had a question. Um, Eunice, you mentioned um, the concern about the drought, the impending drought and ongoing drought. And it's sort of related, uh, but along the... Uh, the Gulf Coast countries, I have I read an article in the Times about the so-called cloud wars and the attempt to capture, I, I think, uh, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, sort of capture humidity in the air and, and, make, and convert that into water. And so I'm wondering if that's something China is looking at and, and what the, I guess, the geopolitics around that are. They've already been doing it. I think you're talking about cloud seeding. So this is when uh, the authorities will 
shoot certain uh, chemicals or metals into the air, which form crystals in the clouds. It, this, this is my basic understanding of it, which eventually forces rain um, to come. So they've been work, They've been using this type of technology since I I was told the 1940s or so, and it's something that we see in Beijing being used sometimes to to clear the pollution and make the skies look blue on a, an important day politically. Mm. But um, that is one way that the authorities here are trying to um, make sure that they get more water sources. So um, the focus right now has been by the central authorities is to get the local authorities to look for more water sources and um, get uh, farmers the water that they need for their crops. So the firefighters have some of the firefighters have been driving to farmland to water the crops, uh, transferring water to pig farms. Um, there's just been a big push to try to make sure that they are able to get the um, the autumn harvest um, taken care of for just because it's it's looking pretty grim right now. And Bob, this sounds like it would be in your portfolio as a meteorologist. Uh, yeah, I have written a fair amount about cloud seeding over the years. And yes, as Eunice was saying, that's a uh, China has been very active in this. Uh, one challenge with cloud seeding is that you, you can't just take a clear sky day and make it rain. You have to have enough of a setup where there's clouds and moisture and it's on the edge of raining, basically. And then in some cases, cloud seeding could conceivably push it over to where it does rain. And, and it's accepted that this probably does work some of the time in some cases, but proving that is really difficult because as the, the Times article pointed out this morning, um, once it starts to rain, you, you've gotten rid of your case example study. Uh, you can't go back and have the exact same cloud and see what would happen if you didn't seed it. So proving that cloud seeding is what made it rain is exceptionally difficult. And there's been efforts for decades to do that proof in various countries. And uh, it's still have been a challenge, but nevertheless, many states in the U.S., many nations uh, continue to proceed with cloud seeding. So I, I don't, you know, and, and when you have a drought going on for weeks and weeks in a place and it's there's simply no rain at all, you, you know, cloud seeding really isn't much help there, unfortunately. And I'll mention as a side note, though, this is our climate story of the week and not one of our human rights segments uh, that since I mentioned solar panels and China exporting solar panels, um, Wall Street Journal is reporting this summer, among other news outlets, that U.S. Customs has detained shipments from some of the biggest solar panel producers from China as authorities here enforce a new law targeting good, goods made with forced labor in China. I think that very much includes forced Uyghur labor in China. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as we end our coverage for today of the world's worst heat wave on record by many measures, some of which we've talked about in this segment happening in China right now. And we leave it there with Bob Henson, meteorologist, journalist, and regular contributor to Yale Climate Connections, and Eunice Yoon, Beijing bureau chief and senior correspondent at CNBC and NBC News, who joined us live from Beijing, meaning thank you for staying up late for us, Eunice. We really appreciate <laughs> it. And, and My pleasure. Bob, and Bob, thank you very much, too. Oh, thank you. My pleasure.